Tonight is the 35th annual Preservation Awards Banquet and it is one of my favorite, favorite events. It's when we honor individuals, organizations, and elected officials who have helped the cause of preservation in our state. Number one, it's a good economic development tool. We're here at the Heidelberg Hotel, which uh, faced the wrecking ball for many years and now look at it, what, what commerce it brings into our city. We need our buildings to remember our past, to tell our stories, um, and it makes our town, our cities, our state unique. I feel Louisiana, the whole state, is a big museum myself. The foundation is an organization that uh, fosters the restoration and the preservation of buildings, cultural uh, activities in the, within the state of Louisiana. Louisiana is unique in a lot of states. We have been around a long time. We, like, unlike other states, have resources that have been here since the 1700s, 1800s. And we have a resource like New Orleans, a resource like the old parts of Baton Rouge, that if we, if we want to uh, cherish them, we need to preserve them so that our children, our grandchildren can, can live in the history that we grew up in. We are here to recognize individuals and groups that have done volunteer service primarily for the state of Louisiana and we need to remember that it is something that everyone should take the opportunity to do. Well, tell us um, a little bit about the book that you've written. Well, uh, by now pretty much everybody knows it's about Edwin Edwards and, uh, and it takes his life from the beginning all the way up until now. Well, actually up until he went to prison, but, uh, but you know, it, it's, I've really been gratified by the, you know, 50,000 people who bought the thing and have actually, some of those have actually read it. And uh, they really talk about how it's such a stroll down Louisiana's memory lane because we all grew up in that era. And so it's as much really a biography of the state as it is of uh, Edwin Edwards, um, which I really like. And uh, one thing I've been gratified too is the number of librarians. Of course, the librarians gave me the Louisiana Literary Award uh, back in February, and they said they're using the book as much in reference as they are in biography. So, you know, it means that people are calling up and saying, hey, when did, what, when did that happen? And then, you know, okay, let's get Leo's book and see. I always had a desire, of course, to write about my history because it's so unusual and, so, and also at the same time so uh, significant because of it shows the rise of a poor Cajun boy on a sharecropper's farm uh, who goes through the public education system of the state and then ends up in Congress and then as in the governor's mansions for four terms, which is unprecedented. And I'm very proud of that. And also during that long span of my political life, much has happened to Louisiana and I wanted to chronicle it so that 50 years, 100 years from now, there would be some ready reference where someone could ease, have easy access to that information. What was your reaction when you saw the book in its final form? I was actually very, very surprised and very pleased. But more than that, the reception and the interest in the book is what has really been amazing. Over 50,000 copies have been sold. And frankly, when we were writing the book, I've had uh, been asked, I'd have said, well, if I can sell 10,000 books, I'll be very happy. And uh, it shows that the people of Louisiana have a continuing interest in what is happening and has happened to our state and what makes Louisiana great in some areas, maybe not so great in others, but a state that we're all very, very proud of, and I certainly am. I've been working for the past year as a fellow uh, with the National Trust in New Orleans, and we've been focusing on both a major issue, which is the uh, hospitals fight over the LSU VA hospital, which was proposed for Lower Mid City, which has result, resulted uh, in the destruction of a very large swath, 67 acres, in a national historic district. So we've done our best to raise awareness about that issue, to advocate for moving of buildings instead of de demolition, um, and to push for responsible planning uh, so that we don't have disasters like this again. Uh, New Orleans made it through Hurricane Katrina and the flooding that happened, but this particular neighborhood, even as it was struggling to get back online as people were renovating their homes and moving back, um, was basically destroyed. There's no other word for it. 
And so it's, it's now about trying to make sure that the lesson has been learned, that we find a better way forward when it comes to some of these great historic areas that really make both New Orleans and Louisiana special. Um, we've worked on a number of other issues though in the, the city's ongoing blight fight, trying to find alternatives to demolition to say that some of the great, unique, historic architecture here, even if it's vacant or blighted, um, we need to find other methods such as urban homesteading or deconstruction or salvage, trying to find different arrows in the quiver so it's not just demolition. Over the past several years we've been in a project to restore and reopen the King Hotel and it's now Hotel Indigo, a boutique hotel in downtown Baton Rouge. And previous to that we were very involved in the Crest Levy restoration which is where the little village is located. It's condominiums and offices and shops. Why is it so important to you to preserve Louisiana history? Oh, our history is so special to Louisiana, it's so unique, and our families worked a long time in preserving our heritage through education and public service, and it's a way to pass on to our future generations what a very unique and special place we live in. 2008, the church was heavily damaged by Hurricane Gustav, and before that, it had been there for over 100 years, untouched, and for whatever reason, the steeple was just twisted off really bad in the hurricane and it suffered a lot of water damage um, and it was up for demolition so we kind of got wind of it in Bayou Gula and you know didn't want to see one of our last historical buildings gone. Um, there's not much left in Bayou Gula because the levee's been moved twice so a lot of it's in the Mississippi River. So this is one of the you know the very last buildings we have um, with historical significance in our little village. So um, we haven't done a whole lot as far as restoration, but the biggest thing that we've done was save the church from demolition. I mean, they um, it was scheduled for to take bids for um, tearing it down and selling the wood and whatnot. And we, you know, make a long story short, we went through the, this whole process, which was about a year, and we bought the church, formed a nonprofit organization, Friends of St. Paul Church, and actually saved it. So we now own it, and no one, no one can take it from us now. The um, foundation runs three gift shops in Baton Rouge, in various museums, and up until I got there, they had, I mean, they were operating out of a cigar box, if you will. So we bought computers and I installed software so that they could keep track of their inventory and their profits, et cetera, and pass an audit. <laughs> FHL created it here in Baton Rouge to encourage young professionals to become involved in preserving the character of Baton Rouge and the support and supporting the community as a whole. With this in mind, Inherit Baton Rouge was formed in the spring of 2011 with the help of non-public relations seniors from the Manship School of Mass Communications at LSU. As a class assignment in their final capstone public relations campaigns class, the group was asked to choose a nonprofit which to develop and implement a public relations campaign. Fortunately, they chose FHL. They took on the challenge of attracting younger members to the organization and to spread our cause. These students took the assignment extremely seriously. Not only did they get an A for the school project, they were successful in getting 250 people to attend their first fundraiser, the UE Long Neck Pub Crawl held on April 7, 2011. The event was significant in raising awareness and interest in FHL and preservation in general. The event took participants from registration at the old governor's mansion where they learned about Inherent Baton Rouge, preservation in general through an informative video and then a stroll towards several downtown historic buildings that happened to have been renovated into bars and restaurants. <laughs> historic nonetheless. Their work involved much more than the very successful pub, pub crawl. They presented the FHL with a detailed public relations manual outlining steps to attract young people to FHL uh, and we thank them for that. They'll come into much great use. The future should hold promise with such enthusiastic, involved young professionals. Here to accept on behalf of the nine students are Emmy Gill, Zach Lemoyne, Sylvia Madrano, Savannah Urban, Amanda Eisman, 
Megan Johnson, Lindsay Rabelais, and Angela Comperi, and not able to attend was Victoria Schmidt. Make sure everybody's up here. Uh, good evening and thank you very much. Um, each student at LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication looks at our senior class project with fear and loathing. We weren't any different going into this. We had seen our friends in classes before us work extreme hours in conference rooms on campus and have mild breakdowns by mid-semester. While we had our share of panic moments, Really and truly, we were extremely fortunate. Because Emmy and I had both worked for the foundation before, we saw FHL as a great opportunity. There was an organization that had expressed an interest in pursuing a new demographic, a younger demographic, an organization we already had built a relationship with. Brainstorming, planning, setting objectives, buying koozies, securing sponsorships, more planning, all of this led to the formation of Inherit Baton Rouge and the Huey Longneck Historic Pub Crawl. It's funny how college students manage to do something with alcohol. <clears throat> April 7th was our day zero and we were praying, wishing, and hoping that 100 people would show up at the old governor's mansion. By 6.30, people were lined down the driveway. By 7.15, we had registered more people than we had registration material for more than 250 people. By 7.30, they downed the two kegs and drank half of the wine that we had available. <laughs> Our very own historic Louisiana governor, Huey Long, welcomed everyone and kicked off the evening. A chicken in every pot and a beer in every hand. <laughs> Maybe next year we can have another of Louisiana's famous and historic governors give the welcome. I believe he has a few connections with FHL now. The event was a huge success, and it was a gratifying experience for each of us. But for us, the campaign was more than that one night. Months of work, hours in meeting rooms, and droves of emails created something. It's difficult to have an event like this, one where you work so hard, and not develop a passion for what you create. At the onset of the campaign, some of us may have said we were interested in historic preservation, but after this campaign, it's now something we all care deeply for. We may have created a successful event of which we are proud and very appreciative of this recognition, but it is the ladies of FHL who deserve a round of applause. It's their passion and dedication for preserving the unique culture of Louisiana through saving, restoring, and educating people about our landmarks and traditions that is simply outstanding. Our senior class project may have inspired the Huey Longneck pub crawl, but the ladies of FHL inspired us to preserve the past, to cherish the present, and to look at the future through a new set of eyes. They inspired us all to inherit Baton Rouge. Thank you very much. Our next honoree is Elise uh, Grenier. In reading about uh, Elise, I found something interesting. Few people know what they want to do when they're seven years old, but Elise did, and she's done it. At age seven, Elise went on a family vacation to Italy and observed artistic masterpieces that has set her life's direction. She is an LSU graduate with a double major in fine arts and art history. She's an MA from LSU in art history with a concentration in Italian Renaissance. After graduation, she studied in Italy in fine art restoration and conservation, specializing in frescoes, panel paintings, and canvas paintings. She holds degrees from several, I, I, several Italian universities. I can't pronounce the names, I won't even try. They end with what I think means restoration, but Elise can explain that, hopefully. She's a part-time faculty member at Florence's Instituto for Art Restoration. <laughs> Do not know Italian. After working as a conservator for two of Florence's prestigious 
conservation companies, she formed her own, Grenier Conservation. And for 26 years, she has restored major churches, palaces, museums, and villas in Florence and the surrounding area. In reviewing her website, there's a long list of projects. It is utterly amazing what she's worked on. It includes artwork that is from the 12th century, the 14th century, the 15th century. And she's working on that stuff. And she doesn't have a redo button. If she loses the 12th century artwork, it's lost. And I can't imagine having to do that. But she has done it and has made a fine uh, career out of it. She also does reproductions in canvas, panel, and murals, as well as botanical illustrations and painting commissions. Fortunately, for Louisiana's sake, she still finds times to time to come back to her native Louisiana and complete projects. Some of those projects are the Conrad Albrizo Fresco Mural at Louisiana State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport. Once again, a lot of unbillable, uh, unbillable hours looking on the internet this week. You need to go to the website for the Louisiana State Exhibit Museum. It's amazing what that artwork looks like and what has been restored. There also are some Albrizo frescoes in the Capitol Annex that Elise has worked on and the New Orleans Union Pacific Train Terminal. There's two frescoes in Allen Hall at LSU, decorative paintings from the 1830s at Whitney Plantation in St. John the Baptist Parish, mural at Bagatelle Plantation in St. James Parish, statues at Mount St. Carmel in St. Francisville, uh, intensive evaluation of mural paintings at the Lakefront Airport in New Orleans, which is undergoing uh, renovation, and frescoes in the church on St. Alphonsus in New Orleans. The list could go on forever. It is amazing, her work. Ms. Grenier, is, is a, Louisiana is a, Ms. Grenier is a cherished Louisiana resource who generously helps uh, preserve and promote her home state's valuable art history. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Grenier. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. It's such a surprise. As a Louisiana native, it's a pleasure to return to my home state and to be able to apply what I've learned from my second home, which is Florence, Italy, that mecca of preservation. Uh, Italy is notorious about its relaxed mentality about a number of things. You know, you can uh, be late for appointments and eat as much ice cream as you want. <laughs> but one thing that they're very serious about is their preservation legislation. Both in the U.S. and Italy, we encourage conservation efforts with fiscal incentives. But in Italy, restoring a building or artwork is always strictly monitored by the state, even if it is a privately owned uh, building or, or artwork. This is to ensure only the highest standards of conservation. If you own a historic building in downtown or in the country, you can't just get up one day and paint it pink because you like the color pink. Uh, you'll be required to have a team of state professionals. Uh, you'll have architects, historians, art historians, and a materials expert, uh, and photographers. And uh, we will identify the original aspect of the building or the painting, and you'll then be directed to faithfully restore it the way it was originally. Um, this may seem a little invasive with our American mentality. We like to be able to paint our house pink if we, if we prefer to, but just think about it. If they relax the standards in a place like Florence, in the end, it probably wouldn't look like Florence anymore. So that's, that's the danger of it. We have to be very careful. Uh, after being steeped in this Italian preservation mentality, which strictly enforces never, in, never uh, imposing your own agenda, and never taking liberties with original materials, I learned that it's best to move always with caution when making important decisions about what is allowed to stay and what must go. Because as you know, when it's gone, it's gone forever, whether this be a building or even some fragment of uh, original material that can be full of information for us. Uh, so I've been privileged to gain this perspective from working in Italy and, and in Louisiana. And if I can uphold the high standards that are used in Florence through my work here at home, then I'm, I'm gratified. I'm grateful to a lot of people who supported and encouraged me to pursue a career in conservation, and to my parents who took me places and, and showed me things when I was growing up, 
And uh, I'd like to mention an old friend, Carolyn Bennett, who I always admired her work, and I know she had a great impact on my decision to study conservation. Another old friend that I had the honor of knowing was the architect, John Desmond, the great architect, who left a legacy in this state, and, and in my life, he always encouraged me to pursue a career in conservation, also many others. And I'm grateful to have worked on uh, some very special projects in Louisiana, uh, such as the Louisiana State Exhibit Museum in Shreveport. Uh, I've been going back there now over the years with their priceless artwork and frescoes and dioramas. Also at LSU in Baton Rouge for their uh, maintenance of the historic murals on the original campus that they take very good care of and I've had the honor of helping with. Also it's been great working with some dedicated individuals such as John Cummings uh, III of New Orleans uh, who had me work at Whitney Plantation in St. John the Baptist Parish. Soon, uh, it's soon to open as a unique research center with its uh, amazing buildings and decorative artwork that we have there. Thanks to him and people like him that make a personal investment, the buildings were saved and they were properly restored. So I'm very grateful to the existence and the good work of this organization at a time when it's often easier and cheaper to discard rather than rebuild. And more than ever, the Foundation for Historical Louisiana must inspire appreciation and respect for quality, for history, and for human achievement. So thank you very, very much for this honor. What would you like people to keep in mind about the importance of history, uh, particularly with uh, tonight's uh, program for the Foundation for Historical Louisiana, trying to preserve the history for uh, new generations to come? Well, if you're a student of history, then the things in the future don't surprise you as much because human nature has basically always been the same and history is just a situation that keeps repeating itself. So you can almost foretell what a personality is gonna wind up doing in their lives if you're a student of biographies. So in Edward Edwards' case, of course, I mean, he was a little bit different, a little special, but still though, you know, he had the same downfalls and temptations as most men do and, you know, he made good decisions and he made bad decisions, you know, like we all do. But uh, if you're a student of history, chances are you don't get nearly as worked up or, or nearly as put off by suddenly these strange headlines or the world seems to turn bizarre. It's all happened before at some point. It's really important to preserve Louisiana's history because it is the thing that celebrates the culture and the heritage of the people who live here even today. Um, it's a story of the, of the state's past. But even more importantly, in my own example, um, I moved to New Orleans four years ago on the strength of a single visit to the city in 2003 because I fell in love with the place. And what more than anything else connotes that sense of place that's unique to New Orleans? It's the architecture. It's something that you will not find anywhere else. And uh, that's why preserving these things is important because it makes Louisiana unique and distinctive and a true destination, not just any place USA. We really need to preserve our historic buildings. I mean, that's all we have left in you know, our beautiful state. Um, and there's certainly organizations such as the foundation that that really um, is committed to saving these buildings and you know if, if no one speaks out then you know all these things will be torn down and we, we lose pieces of history basically. It's what we are, it's what we have and you know tourism is one of our major industries and so yes I think we should preserve everything. I, I'm a native New Orleanian and my family's been in Louisiana since the 1850s, 1840s, so yeah, I think it should be preserved. Right now in New Orleans, uh, the city is at a tipping point. It's coming back strong after Hurricane Katrina, but it's important that uh, policy makers and officials hear from citizens about the things that matter to them, like the great historic architecture and the great historic neighborhoods in New Orleans, because oftentimes you have unsympathetic development or even simple neglect. Um, and that leads to the loss of some of these great treasures. So people need to make sure that public officials are aware that these things are important um, and get that word out there. In my past work in preservation a few years ago, it's so striking to know that that dilapidated building you might see down the corner of your little hometown or the old closed down buildings on your main street, 
really may hold special significant value and they do hold value in your community and just getting involved raising awareness and getting involved with a group like the Historical Foundation or the Preservation Alliance um, is a way to bring attention and then you can restore your community's history which often plays a vital part you will find out in our state's history and Louisiana plays a really unique role in our nation's history so it's a great way to give back to your community your your state and your nation membership is very important we need you for your constituency and your support when we go to the legislature but we are not funded by the state by the city or by the federal government unless it's a special grant for a special project so every year we have to earn our budget and that's not easy so we need members and dues are very modest they start at fifty dollars and even for those under thirty five they're thirty five dollars so we need your support we need gifts we need plan giving we need memberships what are the values of membership? The values of membership are, if you have email, we're going to put you on our email list. You're going to get all of our blasts about events, educational opportunities, uh, parties like this. You're also going to have free admission to the old governor's mansion, Magnolia Mound Plantation, which was one of the first successes of the foundation. You're also going to have 10% off in our museum shops, and you know you're going going to get our quarterly newsletter and the opportunity to volunteer. <laughs> if people have questions or like more information, what should they do? Please go to our website, fhl.org. Call our headquarters, 387-2464.